here for the Kensington Minute. An old maven of the Central Intelligence Agency, he was present at its creation. In fact, he helped create its counterintelligence capabilities. He remained chief of counterintelligence from 1954 to 1975, but he was obsessed with ferreting out high-level penetrations. He was half Mexican, and his father was very wealthy, allowing him to attend America's finest universities. Know who he was? All right, so he was friends with some of America's famous poets, the world's famous poets, Ezra Pound, E.E. E. Cummings, T.S. Eliot. He also cultivated orchids, a lot of them. Yes, he is, of course, James Jesus Angleton, and he earned his stripes in World War II and continued his intelligence works against the Soviets. He made friends in extremely high places. In an earlier Kensington Minute, we discussed his friendship and associations with J. Lovestone, a great anti-communist crusader and leader in the American labor movement. Well, he also befriended Kim Philby, the MI6 traitor, and this really shook him. If Philby was a Soviet mole, what other moles can there be? Had he been naive all these years? In Moscow, Philby looked back wistfully at his days with Angleton, claiming that Angleton was, in his words, a brilliant opponent and a, in his words, fascinating friend who was just catching on to him before his defection. Well, Angleton became very, very suspicious. In the 1950s, there were some CIA assets, namely KGB officers, who began disappearing. One was Petr Popov, who simply vanished. Then it emerged that he had been arrested by the KGB. So who revealed the connections of Popov to the CIA, hmm? In the 1960s and 1970s, Angleton began to claim that Pierre Trudeau, the Canadian prime minister, was an agent of the Soviets, and that Swedish prime minister Olaf Palma and West German chancellor Willy Brandt, as well as British prime minister Harold Wilson, were making themselves very useful to the Soviets. I wonder why. Did they have something on them? He also moved CIA personnel around whom he suspected of dubious loyalty, moved them to less strategic offices, often in the middle of nowhere. This became too much for William Colby, who in 1973 was named Director of Central Intelligence. Colby demanded that Angleton resign. And more than a few people in the agency were just delighted to see him go. At the same time, the Church Committee revealed hidden counterintelligence activity that alarmed many Americans. They really didn't understand what was going on. Investigative journalists and historians availed themselves of stacks of documents that had just been declassified, and some retired CIA employees expressed their concerns about what's going on. So... Angleton was out of the CIA and returned to his passion of poetry and tending orchids. There are several books about them. I think you should check out The Ghost by Jefferson Morley, a Washington journalist. The title comes from his moniker. He kind of holed himself up in his office, didn't walk out much, became The Ghost. Okay, David Martin's Wilderness of Mirrors, I think, is a very fine and informed read. It's a little bit old. It came out in 1980, and so some of it may be dated, but I recommend it for your bookshelf, the kind of book you'd want to buy and keep it there. So, what is the final verdict on the ghost? Well, a veteran CIA officer, Cleveland Cram, investigated him in detail, calling him, in his words, self-centered, ambitious, and paranoid, with little regard for his agency colleagues, or simple common sense, unquote. So he was a visionary and a crank and a prophet and a lawbreaker, a national security menace just ahead of his time, according 
to cram. Okay, well, I can promise you there are more charitable descriptions of him and the service he did. The books are out there, but what do you think? This Kensington Minute does not represent the official position of the United States government. Take the Kensington Challenge. Out here.